Hello and good evening, everyone. Um, on behalf of our team, I extend a very warm welcome to all of you to the seventh day of the Kola Varki Design Forum 2020. My name is Aditi, and I will be your host for the evening along with Khevna. Today, we present our third detox session carrying forward from yesterday's curated discussion on the sub theme human nature. Detox, are KVDF extend, detox at KVDF extend beyond presentations to insightful dialogue with exceptional experts from the field who share with us their personal journeys and experiences. We are extremely grateful to Kunjan Gurd and Robert Powell for being here to become a part of this session. Kunjan Gurd, Kunjan Gurd is joining us from Kochi. She is a SEPT alumni and co-founder of Mango Architecture Alliance with architect Raj Menon in the year 2006. In 2011, Mangrove amalgamated with design tree of, architecture, of architect Niranjan Das Sharma to form RGB architect, architecture studio, a critical practice based in Kochi that strives to articulate context-sensitive architecture amidst emergent conditions. Kunjan has also been actively involved in architectural academics since 2016 and has been consistently striving to redefine the relationship between theory and practice as mutually complementary. Our second panelist, Robert Powell, is joining us from Malaysia. He is a practitioner, academician, and writer whose architecture and master planning is driven by a strong emphasis on respect for the existing ecology reinforcing biodiversity and establishing a network of habitats. He has been an associate professor in the School of Architecture at NUS and has authored and edited more than 30 books where most of his work deals with architecture of tropical dwellings in the context of Southeast Asia. A very warm welcome to both of you. We will begin uh, the session with the two presentations by the panelists, which will be followed by a conversation between them. The dialogue will then extend to all the attendees as we take on the question answer round. All audience members are invited to ask questions in the Q&A tab of your Zoom window. Upon selection of your question, we will prompt you to turn on your video and audio to become a part of the conversation. Kunjan ma'am, I invite you to present your screen. I audible and the presentation is visible? Yes. yes. Uh, so thank you, the entire people of the forum. Uh, heartfelt thank you for having us here. Um, so this is an emotional moment, honestly, uh, sort of a homecoming. Uh, because though one has been to the city several times and to the institution, um, to be called is is an acknowledgement of the calling that took root in, in the institution uh, back then. And it is from within that disposition that one wants to tell the story of the practice rather than speak of the projects, which is not to set a binary between the two at of making, uh, thinking through what is made and learning through what one does also to put this work in, in the context of the larger thematic developed for the forum, uh, we are deeply in recognition of the fact that all of our actions are taking place within a landscape that is already negotiated, appropriated, and not just in recent times, but over millennia. Also in recognition of the fact that nature is us. We are nature and the conflicts that pervade all aspects of our being are the conflicts that we define with nature. So all actions with this reverence and this deference uh, may result in relevance. So one looks back to chart out some engagements that have stayed the course with us, become hauntings, if you will, 
so the presentation is thus part chronological and articulates questions that the work helped us negotiate. But this is also with the understanding that these same questions are synchronous and present at all times. So someone we look up to uh, recently pointed out the difference between questions and scholarship and uh, said that everyone can have questions, but it takes prolonged and consistent engagement to articulate response. And again, someone we look up to had articulated uh, that intuitions are deeply contextual and it takes years of hard work to hone intuition such that it begins to channelize one's intentions. So here's with the hope that the journey continues towards building up erudition and intuition simultaneously. So this is one of our first projects, an artist residency in Delhi in 2006, and we programmed it into spaces of private living, working, and leisure. Leisure that also contained exhibiting. Um, and we worked on two simultaneous organizations. What you see here takes a fractal root with each group being a nest of all these three set categories. And this one here, which is done, like I said, simultaneously, is, is an exploration to see uh, how these three would form three distinct groups in and of themselves. So this idea of practice as that which exists between and across these categories has stayed on from them. Uh, one may also read this as, as, as initiators of conflict of some sort. So this is a project again of an artist place of living, working and leisure situated in a village in North Kerala. And here the practice gets articulated as between deep ecological impulses, artisans and the essential joy of shaping material. Um, incidentally, the, the artist's son was, was a student here at SEP at that time and, and some of them from that batch have done their training here on site. This was also the time when we were making our own place of work within the place we lived in. And this living, working, recharging compound idea of a practice can be articulated in, in, in several ways as, as agency, rigor and joy, but also in mundane architectural parlance as, as space, materiality and vitality. And this idea has stayed with us and evolved with us, even as late years later, we moved into our current studio, uh, because that place did not have enough parking. So, so this part, uh, to begin here, I would say that, that we are an optimistic bunch of people. We do believe that evolution occurred in spite of the space of the sapiens. And we, and we think that the world and if we think that the world is going to end because of us, we may just be giving ourselves a little too much importance. Uh, so if, if life will continue to evolve within this world that we inhabit and try to know, or even after it, then that is the affirmation one needs to continue working, because otherwise one must stop producing anything anymore right away. So within this evolutionary affirm affirmation, we ask what is identity? So for for a number of years, we did residences, and sometimes it felt as if that's all that we were doing. Um, and one faces these questions here. Um, does, the, does the house identify with the client? Or does the house identify with the architect? Or um, yeah. does the house identify with, with place? Or does the house idea, uh, does the house identify itself with the idea of houseness itself? Um, and we try and find solace in, in, in the collective spaces of these questions. Uh, the client is, is a part of a larger people. Um, the place is a part of a larger geograph. And our, our own language is, is a part of a larger continuity of language. Um, though it is also imperative to note here that the etymology of the word 
conflict contains within it the word of uh, the, the idea of the collective. So, um, anyway, so then it's it's you know we try and uh, locate the work there, and and oftentimes in very simplistic terms we we, we find it between groups and and uh, and planes. And scenes and landforms. It's not strictly a residence, but within the type. Just quickly taking you through some of the work that has happened. So all of these images that you saw are, are uh, more or less private um, residences, private uh, commissions. So obviously are, these are more or less affluent clients. And then in, in, in 2018, when, when the floods hit, hit, hit Kerala, uh, we had a significant, if not the first, essential interaction that resulted in this, uh, the cabin house. It was a house made within one to 1.7 lakh uh, rupees within a period of two to four weeks. And um, so on the left, you see uh, the system that was developed and this was in accordance with the material that was easily available at short notice from around the site and keeping in mind the skin sets that were available in the immediate vicinity, all we had to do is 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 to is to make a system of that, impart some amount of training, and make the system um, in a way such that it it responds to the individual need of of each family, which you see on on the right, where you know with the changing profile of the clients and the land that is available, you could come up with different configurations. Um, some of the spaces that these are some early houses, and and this is this is one of the only projects where we were very happy to be kicked out of it uh, because eventually they they figured out how to do it themselves, and we were not needed anymore. And several, several um, iterations of, of this have happened and they've happened all over the place. They happened again um, the following year where in different places there were uh, landslides and so on. Um, it went to the media, it went to the media without us. Uh, we, we were nowhere in, in the scene. It was all about the people who were doing it and, and it's, it's, it's gratifying in a way. Uh, and that, that in a way lets us articulate this question that we began with. What is identity, and and you know, uh, within the space of the collective, we we right now we articulate it as as something that is specific but not identical. Um, so all right, so uh, so the next part. Um, so the practice is specific too. The, you know, it's specific to its to its place, to the aggregate of people that are bound through it. The aggregate of the places that that the people come from, the years they manage to live through it, and so on. Um, uh, and this part, the installations part, uh, where is is this activity through which we have built this people? So formally, of course, there are only three of us, but uh, over the years, the this people has has grown not only as people who have worked with us, but also people who we think are our tribe. Um, we don't sort of physically band together, uh, but there are these short bursts of engagements, events, largely unsolicited work that have grown to become meaningful relationships for us um, in our work and as people. Uh, so this idea of community as not some now not only the relations that that work is born into but also but also the community that you that you build through your practice. Uh, so this was a, a series of, of curated talks that happened way back in two thousand eight nine 
um, uh, started then, went on up to 2011. Um, this was an event uh, that was that was uh, curated for the IAA Kuchin. Um, the theme was was through the students, uh, but so, we, well, so through this we've met some incredible people, so, you know. And um, it's, yeah, right. Uh, this space here is 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 a is a space that lasted for three years. It's in the middle of the city. It was in the middle of the city on a leased piece of land, uh, totally temporarily constructed, and it housed um, ecological products, practices, workshops, people, events, and and so on. Quite a vibrant um, existence it had. Um, this was this this was uh, an installation. This is seriously an installation that we did for uh, for the Kochi Biennale, but it was it was it was an occupiable installation. You know? So a lot of people sort of came through it to come and take selfies and so on. We did this with um, Kaid uh, Tungarwala and Rajiv Thakur. Um, And also, I mean, yeah, I mean, the material palette is sort of self-evident. It was, it was completely through the junkyards of Kuchin. Uh, this, this again, uh, so I'll, I'll get to that a little later. This was the tracing narratives, uh, you know, uh, the, the traveling uh, landscape exhibition, Aniket Bhagwat's uh, exhibition that happened. And then following this, we were supposed to host the, the death of architecture, but then uh, the floods hit and, and the floods hit literally on the same day as, as the shipment arrived from, from Goa. Um, so the we that I speak of in, in, in a couple of these uh, events is a we that is not just our practice, but it is, it is a very spontaneous grouping of people, independent practices. Um, but we all, we all get together. It's, it's informally called the, the Kochi Collective. Um, and we get together for work. So this, what you see here, is is the doc, is a documentation of a, of a practice based out of Alapura. Um, it's a it's a remarkable practice um, in for several reasons. We're not not getting into details here. But the practice, I mean, all of us, we got together. The offices got together to conduct this this sort of a, a documentation and archiving of, of this. Uh, his work so so we get together often sometimes it's it's to, it's to discuss each other's work uh, a lot of times it's just for fun to talk about other unsolicited um, sort of provocations um, so, and and this last part here so this one is is, is almost like a borderline case between between this last part and and uh, the, this part i spoke about and the next which is also the last part um, so this is an event that came out of literally years of musings within the office space. So this living monsoon was a was was a two year old or two year long uh, festival that was thought uh, for, again for the IA Kuchin. Um, and uh, so what you see on 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 the screen is is the Kapun Tiger climate classification map where you know which puts our city our location. In a very different kind of a uh, of a relation spaces from all over the world, um, similar realities from across the globe, and what binds us, what brings us together, is the soil, the vegetation, um, the water, the sun. That is what brings this entire belt together. Um, so a series of events. Um, what were, were, were sort of conceptualized across scales, right from small to yeah, and and Robert's work, I'm, I, um, you know, Robert's work has been hugely influential, you know, as as the research material from from that part of the world, from Indonesia, Malaysia, a lot of his books they, they sit right here, and 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 they have they have served in sort of uh, letting us think about about this project. Um, so this is the the last part and institutions. Um, so institutions as as organs of law, of course, but also as the idea of standing upright, of taking deep root, um, 
and to be seen in, in proximity to the previous idea of, of building communities as, as a rhizomatic idea. Um, so so for, a, for, for, a, for a cultural and educational institution that we had to program in Tamil Nadu, uh, we literally became students again. And we took a, a road trip across the Kaveri Basin. We went, uh, we started from, from Trichy, we went to, um, you know, we went to care to school and, and we, we traveled all the way up and you know, visited several places, Subich, Pondicherry. Um, and then upon coming back, um, you know, uh, we, we, we figured that you know, contextual understandings are, are deep rooted and, and therefore this juxtaposition of, of the two ideas that con con contextual understanding has been deep rooted as institutions of a place are. Uh, so upon returning, we, we began with, we began working with clay to sort of find these these spaces of, of shadow and, and thickness and uh, counter in a way to the roots that we had become so habituated uh, with. And, um, so this is where it's at, it's, it's still work in progress. Some articulations from there. Uh, and here, this one is it's again, quickly, um, so th this, it's 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 a, it's an intervention within an existing 10 acre vineyard factory on the outskirts of Putin where the client brilliantly has this uh, wisdom to tell us that uh, in the near future when when urbanism when the city sort of just spreads and takes over its its surroundings he wants to see this place as as this as a green hub, he, he, you know, as, as a place where there are rare trees and rare um, species of birds and, and so on. So, so we programmed this, this intervention and we, we, we call it the return of the snake. Um, so it's just something there. And it is, it is also uh, within this idea of taking roots uh, that, that one would want to talk about our work with students, which coincidentally has also happened in the later years of our practice. Um, it belongs here because, because it requires us to articulate our relationship to our histories and our messy genetic pools as we look towards possibilities. Um, so, so this is an aside story, but you know, a group of us who, who, have, who have been working together over the last two years, uh, our WhatsApp group is called uh, Korombok. Um, it's, it's, it's a language, it's a, it's, a, it's a word within most Southern languages that means um, wasteland. It means uh, a land which is cast outside or in legal terms, just uh, no man's land. Um, it's a condition that, that uh, T.M. Krishna has beautifully rendered in one of his compositions and a term we thought most appropriate for, for the uncertainty of this space of teaching, learning, the space of externalization, if you will. Um, um, and this is the latest turn that, that the work has taken where a lot of us are involved in this, in this new school goes to, goes to Cochin called Seed. Um, still have a long way to go with that. We're still online, which is what I wanted to show here. Um, so that is it. Um, and to end, this is a little, little bit to, to Professor Varki uh, with a little hope from, from his forum book, uh, Eliot's Wasteland. Uh, it's, a, it's with a little hope and, and a little prayer that the practice continues with a sense of offering sympathy, self-restraint, and peace. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your insightful presentation. Now I would like to invite Robert, sir, to present his screen. Uh, 
Hello. Um, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. You wish me to commence now? Yes. Okay, <laughs> all right. Well, um, thank you for inviting me to the forum once again. I am honored to be among the invited participants and I have enjoyed the exchanges over the last uh, week. I'm going to recount my personal journey in architecture and experience in the, in, in the realm of practice. It's actually very pleasant to be asked to do this. I, I can't think that I've done it before. And it's quite, quite remarkable. The last, I was just thinking the last time anyone asked me to recount my progress so far, must be way back 40 years ago when a student came into my office in the National University of Singapore, he was writing a, an article for a student magazine and asked me to tell me about my journey in architecture. So now, 40 years later, I'm, uh, I'm now being asked the question again. Fragments of a journey. Fragments of a journey, Let's, just a quotation here. Fragments by nature have no beginning or ends. But as in Shumi's fragments of architecture have to be understood not as the breaking up of an image, but as a dialectic multiplicity, excess of different discourses, where the overall expression, overall expression takes through shape through the movement between the fragments. Um, excuse me, sir. Uh, you have not shared your screen. Uh, just How do I do that? Come on. Um, you'll have this option, share screen, if you open the Zoom window. I have to go back again to... To the Zoom, yes. Uh, where are we? Uh... So on Zoom, uh, you'll see on, on the bottom, there is uh, there are some op options and share screen will be one of those. Ah, it's hidden behind here. Okay. I'm so sorry. I got, I'd lost it behind my... How's that? And then I go to here, yeah? Yeah, you select the screen that you want to share and... Yeah, we can see your screen now. Are we in there now? Yeah, yeah, we're there. Okay, now then I'll go back to uh, uh, full full screen mode. Okay. Yeah. How is that? Yeah, I'm this is perfect. This is perfect. I'm going to go back then to that to the start again. So uh, here we are, fragments of a journey. And then I read a, a quotation from Shumi on uh, fragments of architecture have to be understood not as the breaking up of an image, but as a dialectic multiplicity excerpts of different discourses, where the overall expression takes shape through the movement between fragments. So, uh, my entry into architecture came about as a process of elimination. I was uh, reasonably good at economics and geography at school, and, uh, but I could illustrate well, I could draw well. And this offered the chance of an art scholarship and I applied, applied for and I was successful, which enabled me to enter the School of Architecture at Durham University in the north of England. I also had the vague notion that I could change the world that I inhabited. My grandfather was a steel worker. Here's my grandfather, Nort, Arthur Norton here, and a committed socialist. Uh, the newspapers in my grandfather's house were decidedly left-wing. The Daily Worker was his usual read, and the even more left-wing was the Soviet Weekly. My father down here was no less determined to give his son a good education, to enable me to escape the relative poverty uh, that had been born in, he had been born into, and for his children to have chances that were denied him. My father actually, family actually lived in, a, in some wooden uh, uh, shacks, I say, call them shacks, they were actually built in about 1914 to house Belgian refugees who fled Europe uh, in the face of the First World War. And they came to Sheffield in the north, e north of England and they, they worked in the munition in, uh, industry. When they left, the wooden, wooden uh, uh, structures were given to relatively poor people and dad was brought up in that. So there was a strong imperative to produce architecture with a social purpose. Though to be honest, the education that I received at Durham University did not strongly emphasize that aspect. We were taught the basics of classical architecture, followed by the modernist heroes, Le Corbusier, Marcel Breuer, Frank Lloyd Wright. We were introduced to life drawing and building construction details. 
in books by Mackay and structures by Cassie and Napa. Who really in, uh, influenced me then at university? Well, uh, Professor Jack Napa, who is on the front row there, and alongside him, Professor Douglas Wise. Interestingly, all the, uh, the, 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 university, the teachers at Durham University were practicing architects. Only the historian, Bruce Alsop, was a pure academic. Theory did not figure large in the syllabus. There was a strong emphasis on function, cost effectiveness, and buildability. By the end of year two, we were required to produce a set of working drawings. You can see here that the, the, uh, the graduating class of 1966 um, was all male. That's quite an important comment on, on, on the time. My first project was done in my year out between uh, third year and fourth year. And I designed a village school completed in 1964. And I experimented with a laminated timber uh, frame structure over an octagonal hall. It's still there 55 years later. So it must work and it, it, it's still standing. I had a very strong work ethic. It doesn't ensure great design, I know, but it's a valuable asset, asset to have for any aspiring architect. It's interesting, as I say, that all the graduates in 1966 were male and most were from middle-class families uh, and, 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 and we went into a middle-class profession as it was then. Upon uh, graduation, I joined a small local practice of just three architects, all about 10 years older than me and all had graduated from the same institution. In this small practice uh, in the north of England, I managed to accumulate experience of design, detailing, construct, detailing and construction management, client meetings, meetings with consultants and local authorities. And two years after graduation, I was made an associate partner. And after six years, in 1972, I was invited to become the fourth partner in the practice with the 17.5% share of the profits. So far, so good. The practice grew, and by the late 1970s, we had 45 people, with about half of them were qualified architects. The projects produced were not great theoretical designs, yet each was rigorously debated in the office and attitudes were formed about conservation, about materials, about scale and appropriate form. I did several conservation projects and these were published in magazines about uh, heritage buildings. There's a Victorian terrace on the uh, left of your screen. It was adapted for use as a as a prestige city center office. And then there's a 14th century um, priory, the Black Friars Priory in the center of your screen. This was adapted as a visitor center and a restaurant and some inner city housing was constructed alongside of it to the same scale and with uh, appropriate materials that uh, didn't exactly match the, the priory materials of the priory, but they, were, they complemented the material. And on the, uh, one of the major projects that I worked on in those early, early years was the restoration of several historic railway stations for the Tyne and Ware metro system. The metro ran on the same uh, railway path as the old railway lines, which were made redundant. But the stations remained, and we had to slot into them uh, some smaller stations for the, for the metro to run. Housing projects were designed for both public authority and private developers. One of the big things of the time at that time were, was pedestrian vehicular segregation. And uh, this was a achieved both in the uh, public housing. This is a, a public housing project here where the pedestrian uh, route was along the center in a raised walkway where vehicles entered from the perimeter and there were courtyards uh, for the uh, shared, which was shared by the residents. In the private sector, there was a little slightly different uh, uh, to morphology, but some fundamentally the same thing. There were, uh, there were courtyards with uh, houses, two story, three and two and a half story houses, looking into a shared vehicular court. And at the rear of the courtyards was a pedestrian 
uh, route al uh, along the, uh, the center axis. So again, segregation between um, uh, vehicles and, uh, and, and, and pedestrians. We looked at the idea of safe space for children. The work of Oscar ne Newman in dependable space was important. Present, providing places for children to play, which was safe, and where they were observed by their parents, probably looking from a kitchen window so that the children could play in relative safety. So, as I say, our architecture, while maybe not of the highest uh, theoretical level, did, did address uh, questions that seemed to be uh, appearing in the 1970s. Public, now, urban design was a, was, was a very new subject in the 1970s. Uh, the publications on uh, urban design by Jane Jacobs, by Kevin Lynch, by Gordon Cullen, and Christopher Alexander emerged, emerged in the 1960s and 70s. And uh, they permeated our collective thinking on urban space and placemaking in, in, uh, in housing. I designed several factories which received minor awards. And in many ways, they investigated the gap, uh, uh, the gap between development and labor. This brought me back to my grandfather, who always raged on about the, the separation of management and la labor, them and us, as he would say, and the class distinction that reflected my grandfather's socialist le uh, learnings. I tried in these factories uh, to bring together management and labor to make them visible to each other and to make some uh, conscious effort to create uh, a, a, an industrial climate where people could negotiate rather than be uh, at, at odds with one another. I decided to pursue a planning qualification by part-time study and in 1975 at the age of 33 or thereabouts I became a registered town planner. And this is a competition entry for the master planning of the waterfront at Newcastle upon Tyne. It took second place in an RIBA competition. And although the winning scheme was never carried out, the thinking informed planners. And in the following decades, developments took place by Norman Foster and others along the, uh, the, the waterfront of the River Tyne. The projects I was doing ran into millions of pounds and included for interchanges on 29 stations on the state on the Tyne and Weir Metro and the design of several retail uh, shopping uh, uh, malls and sh shopping outlets sorry but by the late 70s I yearned to travel and my partners I have to say were generous in giving me leave to spend five months in support of a a research project on onchocerciasis, that's uh, river blindness on the, on the Congo River in Africa in 1974, and another five months as a volunteer planner and writing the management plan for a 200,000 hectare World Wildlife Nature Reserve in Sulawesi Tenga in Indonesia. So I traveled from my job in the north of England, way down here, to southeast, uh, to Sulawesi Tenga, on the southeast uh, top corner of the island of Sulawesi. The planning project was my first encounter with Southeast Asia, and it was a watershed in my career in many ways, in that I engaged with tribal people, the Wana people, who were a nomadic uh, uh, slash and burn uh, tribe. Uh, and it planted the idea in my mind that I might one day work in Asia. I have to say, I look back on the plan that we produced with some misgivings, that the um, thing at the time was to produce a plan for the World Wildlife Association. And it was mainly to do with the conservation of wildlife, the Anoa, the Babirusa, the Macau, uh, the, 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 uh, the Malio birds and the black, uh, uh, black uh, well, a monkey, I can't remember the name, uh, name of it now at the moment, but we were more concerned with the preservation and conservation of animals 
than we were with the conservation of tribal uh, people. And they, I think we did, we did very badly by, in our planning in relation to the uh, conservation of the, uh, the, the lifestyle and uh, the uh, habitat of the, of the people in the jungle. But anyway, this was my first encounter with uh, the tropical jungle, and I lived in the jungle for some five months and uh, eventually wrote the master plan for a 200,000 hectare uh, uh, master plan. This is the, uh, the, 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 the master plan of the area that was surveyed and which was created, and, and a, a World Wildlife Nature Reserve was created in conjunction with the WWF and with the Indonesian Institute of Sciences. This is the uh, hut that I stayed in, the, the local habitat, that I, the dwelling that I lived in, in for some of the time that I was in, uh, uh, in, in, in Sulawesi Tenga. And uh, I recorded all my findings it's with sketches and with watercolor paintings in the manner of travelers of the past, whereas more conversant with this way of recording things than I was with wielding a camera. You have to remember that, a few, the, that at that time, processing film was not well advanced. The few pictures I had were uh, of, of that experience are, are now on fading 35 millimeter transparencies, but the watercolors still exist and they still bring me back to the places that I, I visited. This is Sankayoi and you, it's a place just in, just here on the map that we, we passed through on Taronga and San Coyote just here on the, here we are. There's the very place that I was uh, uh, depicting in this watercolor here. The, uh, this, the, it, it, the, the experience of this house is everything to say about a house in the tropics. I look back on it now and I think, and I usually start my lectures on tropical houses by showing this house. You see it's raised on the ground, it's raised on pilati, so you get away from flooding, you get away from uh, uh, wild animals. It's got a cover which keeps out the monsoon rain and it keeps out the, the hot sun and it allows cross ventilation. These are the things that uh, I, I pursue in modern houses. And yet here is the prime example of a house, a tropical house. My partners also encouraged me to enter at Newcastle University and to teach short courses on art and architecture in Italy in 1981, 1982, and 83. So I painted urban scenes in Tuscany. I painted the waterfront in Venice. And I painted a, a long waterfront here, looking over the Grand Canal towards the uh, uh, Piazza San Marco. And uh, more and more, I began to understand urban design by witnessing it, by walking through it, far better than I could ever learn from lectures. The interplay of space and the light in Cortona in Tuscany, for example, inspired my oil canvases. I painted oils with a kind of fury, a frenzy, uh, applying oil paint with a knife to capture the shifting light of a street, the light coming into a, a narrow gap at, at sunset and throwing light onto a building on the opposite side of the road. And how quickly can you capture that, that uh, shifting of light in the late afternoon? And how the way it, 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 uh, it and how it, uh, it, it, it gave vibrancy to a place. And then the Piazza Comunale and the frame, a space that is framed with overhead cover and steps going up to the, uh, the council chamber. Here is a, a street in, Corto in, in, in Florence um, and I related my experience of urban space to an essay by uh, Christopher Alexander and Serge Shemayev on spatial choreography. And I observed how urban space might be composed in much the same way as we compose music. And I devised a simple notation system. So that here you see on the uh, left, you see a, a narrow space in Florence where you go from a expanded space where you feel the expansion of space to the narrow compression of space and here i devised a system of spatial notation something for spatial enclosure for release of space to the right release of space to the left spatial enclosure overhead spatial descent to the right and left spatial crescendo spatial diminuendo light used as a to, to illuminate space 
space explosion on the right and left, illustrated by small sketches here. And I, I began to understand how one might be able to orchestrate space, to, to choreograph space uh, in the form of an overture, a spatial composition, a method of uh, conveying delight, the juxtaposition of volumes and light. And this became a sort of, uh, you could put this down in a, in a linear form, which was not unlike, which is not unlike the, the, the writing of music. I found myself in a different world in uh, uh, Singapore. I was fortunate to be commissioned by the Aga Khan Award for Architecture to edit four books on identity. My ambition, as I, I, I left ahead of myself there, so my ambition extended then beyond the UK, and I resigned from my practice in 1984 and took up a full-time teaching appointment at the National University of Singapore and a part-time consultancy work uh, job on the design of uh, Singapore metro stations. I found myself, as I say, in a different world. I was fortunate to be commissioned by the Agatha Khan Award for Architecture to edit four books on identity. This is the one on the top here, which uh, a, a, a seminar which was held in 1984, I think it was in Kuala Lumpur. Another seminar on regionalism, which was held in, uh, in uh, Dhaka in uh, Bangladesh. A, a seminar on uh, criticism, which was held in, uh, in, uh, in, in Malta. And a se seminar on housing, which was held in Zanzibar in East Africa. I traveled with the, the Aga Khan to East Africa and to the Mediterranean. And then, and these issues of an identity and regionalism were high on the post-colonial discourse. And I was just very fortunate to be there, to be thrown into this uh, milieu of people talking about uh, their identity, uh, post-colonial identity. And, uh, Regional, uh, regional expressions of modern architecture. Through the Aga Khan Award, I met Charles Career, I met Jeffrey Bauer, I met Ken Yang, William Lim Suwai, Sumit Jumsai, uh, Suwa Oskan, Kerry Hill, William Lim, uh, William Curtis, sorry, and eventually Rahul Mehrotra, who I believe is a, uh, 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 a train at Ahmedabad, and many others. After the editorial, work for the Aga Khan. I, my first book was Innovative Architecture of Singapore. The forward for that book. The seminar in Zanzibar 1987 ignited my interest in contemporary tropical architecture. One paper by Charles Moore and Hassan Udin Khan left a lasting impression and prompted me to begin to research contemporary houses in Southeast Asia. I approached the Singapore publisher, Lena Yuen Lim, and in 1993, she agreed to publish my first book, The Asian House. The, 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 Asian, House. the Asian House was followed by The Tropical Asian House up here uh, in 1996. It sold an amazing 45,000 copies. It's amazing now how many architects have read that. I often meet individuals who said this was the first book they purchased on Asian houses. It again was, I fell on my feet. It was a fortunate time to be where I was. It was a fortunate time to be writing because the, there were not that many books that had been written about tropical Asian houses. The urban A Asian house followed, uh, a complete disaster. It didn't sell anything like the previous two books. Why, what was the reason for that? I think, you know, people, Stick to the word tropical, they don't like the word urban. And all the houses were pr practically the same. They didn't really buy this book, anything like the tropical Asian house. And then I wrote the new Asian house in the year 2000. Over a period of 17 years at uh, National University, uh, I wrote a series of books on houses in Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Sri Lanka, and indeed some houses in Charles, by Charles Korea. Rahul Mehrotra and Valkrishna Doshi in, uh, in India. There's a book yet to be written that analyzes the different typologies of houses in Asia that they unearthed in these publications. I've often thought of acquiring a PhD on the subject, but time rushes by. 
and I really haven't got five years to spend doing a PhD on something that I've already written. I wrote a, a book in 1999 on the, the first book on the work of Ken Yang, and Kishu Kurokawa was invited to write a foreword. This was a groundbreaking tower by, uh, by Yang, the Malaysian architect Yang. It, it sort of was a riposte against and a rebuttal of the international modernism, which produced glass towers all over the world, uh, replicated Western towers in the tropics. And Ken Yang looked at the tower in a different way. He looked at a tower that responded to the wind corn, responded to the sampa, and the elevations changed as you moved around the tower. It was rewarded with a Aga Khan Award in 1995. But the defining tropical house, in my experience, is the Cinnamon Hill House designed by Jeffrey Bauer and built on his estate in Munaganga in 1993. This house, to me, incorporates much of the wisdom that I'd encountered in that uh, uh, indigenous house in Sulawesi in 1979. But here it was built in more, more in permanent materials. But Bauer gave me some hints on how to design in the tropics. Always, he said, have a living room that's open to sky, that's open to the, to the elements, that's open to greenery. Always, never, never chop down a tree on a site. Always move the house rather than moving the tree. Or have as little glass as possible in the house. And so, and, and, and so I began to build up a, a, uh, an understanding of what house in the tropics must be. While writing, books on individual houses, my, real, my major interest was in Asian cities. It struck me forcibly, when I was teaching the subject of urban design at NUS, it struck me forcibly that all the books in my library when I began teaching urban design in 1984 were written with a bias towards Western cities. The books by Kevin Lynch, the books by, uh, by Gordon Cullen, the books by the Creer Brothers, the books by uh, by Christopher Alexander, and uh, and in, and by by Jane Jacobs, and so they all centered on the Western models. And I, uh, on, there's only one book that I encountered. It's by Leonardo Benivolo, and it's written in Italian, Historia della Città Orientale, and it's only one that has just been the Asian city. So I determined to research urban design and cities in Asia and to travel to the major cities in Asia. And over the next 17 years, I did indeed do that. I traveled initially to Malacca, to uh, KL, to Penang. I then went to, I went on in a later journey to Bangkok, to uh, Ayutthaya, to Sukhothai and, uh, and uh, Chiang Mai and Chiang Rai on the, on the border with Laos and, uh, and Cambodia. I moved, I went uh, by train from Hong Kong to, to uh, uh, Shanghai and to Beijing, looking at uh, cities there. I traveled to Manila and Cebu in, uh, in uh, the Philippines and to Indonesia, to uh, Jakarta, to Yogyakarta and on to Bali, to Bun uh, Kampung Aya in Brunei. And then of course I traveled, uh, late, much later I traveled to Rangoon. I traveled to Kathmandu and then to India, of course, and wonderful journeys to India, to, to uh, Cochin, to Goa, to Mumbai, to uh, Jai Salma, Delhi, Jaipur, Chandigarh, Varanasi, Fatapu Sikri, and to, Nepal, to Kathmandu in Nepal. So, and then, of course, to Beijing and to, uh, to Kokoyo and Kyoto. Oh, I always, I became, I say always, I became so interested in the form of cities, how they were initially formed. The uh, nine square mandala of Jaipur with the one square shifted to the south uh, east uh, corner and the palace at the center. The morphology of, of Kathmandu uh, and the palaces in this orthogonal uh, layout there. The, Morphology, not that one can see it any longer, but Mohenjo-daro and uh, its uh, orientation towards cooling breezes blowing through from uh, the, through the narrow uh, alleyways. I was interested in the morphology of Beijing and the, uh, the your passage through the Forbidden City. 
the morphology of Patapusikri, orientated towards Mecca, and all the buildings orientated to Mecca, uh, at, at variance with the slope of the land, which is a ridge running from northeast to southwest. I was interested in the uh, uh, the orthogonal layout of Chang'an, the, the old city of Chang'an, and of course to Amarad, uh, Amdabad, sorry, where one, it's easy to get lost in this uh, uh, maze of trees, a uh, 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 maze of streets in uh, the old Amabad. I was interested in Ayutthaya, the, the, the a city which is accessed by water from the river Chaoprayo and canals that run through the, uh, the, through the city and the lock gates that uh, lock the, uh, the canals when they, there's a high, high water mark. The city of Kyoto, the city of Angkor Wat, and the city of Jai Salma with its uh, intriguing spaces. So what I intended, I've always intended to do, was to write a history of Asian cities and a history of urban design in Asian cities uh, to, to complement all those books that write about uh, the urban design from the point of view of Western cities. I journeyed to India on several occasions. Uh, on, an, on three occasions in late 1990s, I brought groups of, groups of students from Singapore to experience the work of Latians, of Le Corbusier, Bakrishna Doshi, Charles Korea, and uh, the magnificent cities of Jaipur, Jai Salma, Varanasi, and on one occasion and to Nepal and the Kathmandu Valley. When I travel, I take my watercolors uh, with me, and from a seat in a cafe or a tea house, I will record the urban spaces and activities of the cities on my travel. This is the center of Patan in the late 1980s. Uh, it was a city, and possibly still is, I haven't been for many years, a city for pedestrians. There were very, very few uh, vehicles that were, went through the center of Patan. And uh, I sat there in an elevated cafe, looking down into the main, uh, main uh, co concourse, the main street, the main squares of, of Patan, and looked at the way that uh, the placemaking, the way that people use the spaces, the market spaces, the informal sector, uh, the informal eating places, and where people congregated and how they used the spaces, and how the spaces were, uh, were uh, determined. The plan of the city of uh, New Delhi, designed by Latians and Baker, the, the Viceroy's Palace, recorded here on a 35 minute, minute slide, the, at the intersection of the Raj Path and the Jampa, looking down, walking down the, Raj, the, the, the main drag and the slight incline as you come up to the Viceroy's Palace. But I also recorded, re recorded with a watercolor the more public spaces, the markets and the Diwani caste and recording the public spaces. In Gaul, I, I, I recorded the, the fortress, the 16th century fortress, and did watercolors of the public space outside the law courts, dominated by black suit lawyers and their clients on the days when the court is in sitting. So sitting here on a, uh, on a uh, low wall, I recorded the, uh, the uh, lawyers coming in and out in their sweating, in their black robes, whilst their, their, their clients anxiously hung on their coattails, waiting to see what the results of the, the, judge, the judge, judgments that they were, they were there to listen to. I journeyed to Jai Salma, a city created in the 12th century AD. In, uh, there's a large oasis at the foot of the hill. It's a commanding view of the desert. And it's an enormous wall with 99 bastions. But I was more interested in the internal spaces in uh, Jai Salma and walking through these spaces and recording them. But of course, I did a watercolor from the roof of our hotel down below the, uh, uh, the, the city down. And uh, to Sigaria, sorry, to Sigaria, the fifth century uh, capital in Sri Lanka, uh, capital city built on a uh, top of a huge rocky promontory, uh, which you climb 
went through a death-defying climb up the outside here. Some of you may have done it, but it, it's certainly quite hair-raising to climb up the outside of this rock and to, to, this, to the citadel that was on the top. From there, you can look down on the organization of the city in the fifth century and the public spaces, and you can imagine the life that went on there in, uh, in that time. It's evident from the top of the rock. And of course, I came to Ahmedabad, this, um, these amazing spaces in the city the, and the courtyard typology that's recorded here in this watercolor painting. It's easy to get lost in this uh, maze of streets, uh, which often lead you to a dead end, ever narrowing and lead you to a dead end. And then, of course, to Patipu Sikri, uh, I recorded the uh, Duwani Kas sitting here on, an, on, a, on a low wall here, looking across here to record the Diwani Kas, the central column considered to be the axis mundi, the center of the known world. The painting records that space where the emperor uh, invited his, uh, his uh, advisors to come from a corner of the building to consult him at the, on the center, sitting abo above the axis mundi. And Angkor Wat, the elephant wall at Angkor Wat, and this amazing city with uh, uh, several million uh, inhabitants and, and to imagine what this city was like at the height of its power. And to begin the entrance to the Forbidden City from Tiananmen Square. One of, what an incredible experience to sit in this square in 1985. And at that time, every, all the Chinese people wore a blue uniform. It was a time of Chairman Mao, and uh, and and his, or rather his, his, and, his, and his regime, and everyone dressed alike with red with 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 uh, blue uh, denim tops and or de blue tops I should say and blue trousers and a blue flat hat. Both male and female were dressed alike, and uh, thousands of people were queuing up to go into the tomb of Chairman Mao, which was below uh, Tiananmen Square, and then to progress through these spaces through the Forbidden City. And another imperial center, Jaipur. Oh, you, what have we done now? I'm sorry. Where have we gone to? Um, you can share your screen again. Please. Where is it? I can't see. Uh, again, if you, if you open the Zoom, Zoom window, at the bottom, you will see um, the share screen button. It's a green button. I've got that, but I can't see my. Uh, I can't see my. Um, pro maybe you've shut your um, your presentation tab, your file, basically. Sorry. Um. Where have we gone to? Can you help me? Can you? Yeah. Can, can you post it? Um. Can Can you Can you open your file, your I, presentation file? I can't open uh, where it says mail. I I can't see my file any longer on the um, screen sharing. So maybe uh, you just open it on your laptop, on your desktop. You might have closed it there on your desktop. If we can go to the folder again. I don't know what happened there, but okay, here we go. Oh, uh, we, we can share it for you if you want. One second, let's see if we can get it back. I've got it back on my screen. I'm It'll take me two or three minutes to get there, I think. What a pity. That's okay. Mm -hmm. That's okay. No, not a problem. I think I got to secret to Beijing. Wait. 
I got to Jaipur. Uh, so you, you have to, you have to you go see? back. You know, you have to go back to Zoom and click on screen share. Go back to Zoom. If and uh, screen share. At the bottom, yeah. I've got to go back into Google then, I know. We, we could share it for you if you want, your presentation. I think you'd better share it for me, okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. Please do. Yeah. I'm struggling to find, to get, get in there. Not okay. a problem, we'll just share. Can you share, share it? Okay. So here we are. All right. Can we? Can I go down from? Can I move down from here? Can I operate this, or is it? Uh, or do you operate it? How do I move it on? Pressing this here. Um, you, you can just tell me, Robert, I'll just change the slides as you do. Okay, okay. go on to the next slide, please. Okay, next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so this is the, uh, go, go back one. Right. Go, back. Oh, go back, go back. <laughs> go back, go back, go back. Okay, stop there. All right. So um, Jaipur, the next, I, I, I pick up my story at Jaipur, the palace, Mahala, and Amberport to the north of the city. I studied public, the public spaces in, uh, in the city of Jaipur, the, uh, the processional space, the commercial spaces, and this uh, processional space up to the, uh, the, 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 the ramp on, on the back of an elephant to, to climb to the Amber Port. Next slide. Uh, so this is uh, the, the Amber Port at Jaipur and the, uh, uh, the elephants. When I, when I got to the, the courtyard, I would sit, I sat down and I recorded my experience and there with a little painting of the elephants. And this other painting is of the bathing guts at Varanasi in 1982. I got up at five o'clock in the morning and took a boat along the, uh, the uh, Varanasi, along the Ganges with my daughter and painted this picture at about 6 a.m. in the morning uh, using the water from the, from the river. So, And the Lake, Place, uh, Lake Palace at Jaipur. I think the, the, the point of this, putting this slide in is, look at the reflections of the water. And this is another part, a part of uh, urban design. If you're, if you're designing with water, always think about how the reflections will help to enhance the space. I thought yesterday when one of the students was presenting uh, about uh, ponds in uh, uh, and, and a city of ponds uh, and, and uh, the rehabilitation uh, of those ponds, the idea of, of, of reflections in water was something that should be uh, considered. Next slide, please. So in a strange way, all these images are piled in one's memory. They're all there. They're not, they're, they may come from another time, but you, you carry these images in your head of spaces, of compressed spaces, of, of opening out spaces, of spatial explosion, of spaces which are with reflections in water. And when you come to design, a modern uh, setting, these, these pictures come back to you. And they, they, the memory is mined for uh, des when designing contemporary space. I refer to them when designing this urban spaces with a team commission for the Kampong Bugis Development Guide Plan in Singapore in 1990. So why it doesn't look at all like the images I've shown in my paintings there, it nevertheless, it does, uh, it does, remember, it does draw the images that I carry in my head at that time. Next slide. Well, in late 1985, while, while teaching at NUS, I met a young Ceylonese woman 
from Kuala Lumpur, and we married in 1990 in a Hindu ceremony at a temple at Ampang in Kuala Lumpur. She was a journalist on the Straits Times. Our daughter was born in 1993 and graduated from the School of uh, Oriental and African Studies, SOAS in London in 2015. In 2015, next slide, I resigned from Singapore NUS and reloc relocated back to the NUS for a variety of reasons. And after working for a period in local authority planning department, I uh, returned to architectural practice as head of eco master planning in the London office of Llewellyn Davis Yang. The design direction in the practice was set by Dr. Ken Yang, a Malaysian architect, whose work was deeply influenced by the Scottish landscape architect Ian Macau. Macau taught at Pennsylvania State University. Next slide, please. Macau devised a system of layer cake analysis, where he looked at uh, design in this a very systematic way. He looked at the interrelationship of seven factors forming the science of ecology, the climate and microclimate, topography, geology, hydrology, soils, flora, and finally fauna, the wildlife. And I thought yesterday's discussion on say the granite uh, quarry and on the, uh, uh, the, the rehab, uh, regeneration of the ponds uh, in another project. Uh, the, these, uh, these could have benefited by a similar sort of systematic analysis of the site. Anyway, this was the methodology that uh, Yang brought to our practice in London. Next slide, please. This is a, a, a diagram from Macarg's book and it showed how he, he did his, uh, what he called the layer cake analysis. Next slide. Uh, Design with Nature was published in 1969 by Ian McHarg, the Scottish uh, born professor of, uh, of, 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 uh, of landscape architects in the University of Pennsylvania. But uh, when, when writing his PhD at Ken, Cambridge University, Ken Yang studied for a semester under McHarg, and in 1995 he produced a book, Design with Nature, the ecological basis for architectural design. And I learned much from Yang's ecological approach to design and architecture. Next slide, please. Uh, he used uh, everything that he's designed, was subsequently designed, uh, including these low energy and bioclimatic design, ecological land, land, natural resource management, and designing low environmental impact buildings. Next slide. Starting point for every uh, master plan that we ever did was to do, to do this shift mapping or layer cake analysis. We looked at the uh, solar path and the wind direction. We looked at the uh, natural vent, uh, drainage pattern. We looked at the topography. We looked at the existing vegetation, the views analysis, the slope analysis, until we eventually uh, landed upon the proposed land use uh, zoning, which came to an analysis of the land suitable for, for development. Thus, next slide, please. In 2011, I headed a team that produced a master plan for an extension to the city of Mosul in Iraq, a new district to the south of the city of Nineveh. Again, this was a the city came about, or this extension of the city came about, looking at it very carefully at the hydrology, the hills, the hydrology pattern, the river that flowed into the uh, Euphrates, and, and and the design of the city around these these factors. The next slide, please. Something quite different, was, but used the same sort of analysis, was a Qatar uh, Airways village in Doha in 2008. This is a facility close to the airport in Doha for 20,000 cabin staff employed by uh, Qatar Airways. The roof, the, the whole site is covered by a vast roof, which is, uh, uh, which is not, uh, it, it, it's a sort of metaphor for, for a palm tree that is, uh, that shades you and you sit, you sit, you, you can rest underneath it. But in fact, what it is, is a whole range of solar panels and uh, uh, water collection channels to make, to bring uh, energy and water. And when water does come to the city to store it and to use it in the, in the Qatar Airways village. Next slide, please. Next slide. 
In 2013, we moved on to the design of the Mist, a hill resort at Kasauli in the Putos of the Himalayas, 60 kilometers north of the Chandigarh. This again used that uh, SIM mapping uh, technique to decide where the housing should go. Next slide, please. Designed on an incredibly difficult site for Tata housing. It's, the, it's known as the MIST, M-Y-S-T, and it was designed in 2013, 2014, but it's still building. Incrementally, they're adding uh, houses and the, the main uh, community center to it. And you can find it on uh, Google and see how it is progressing now. The development is still building, and though it, it has commend, uh, considerable amendments from the original design. And another, another project, next slide, please. In 2013, the Bombay Glassworks Tower, a tower designed on a former glassworks in uh, Mumbai, inspired by the, uh, an earlier tower by Charles Correa, this one which you'll be very familiar with. But our plan, our tower was about, 20, sorry, about 30 to 40 stories high, and it was uh, a rotating uh, plan with four uh, apartments rotating around a central uh, core of elevators and escape stairs. And every house, uh, every apartment, had 25% of it was uh, a, a, a landscape garden. And the, the apartments rotated uh, uh, as you climbed up the tower so that ne you never looked at an, uh, directly into a, a neighbor's apartment. And there's a CGI of the uh, design. Next slide, please. Here's a seafront development at Madinat Al Arab, again using the same principles to generate the design. Next slide. And two universities designed by the practice in Libya between 2012 and 2014. These are uh, at Hun and Ujdabia on the northern edge of the Sahara Desert, and the space on the campus uh, are designed to respond to the climate and the culture of, of Libya. Next slide, please. And a huge design, which was a competition entry for the King Abdullah city for atomic and, atomic and nuclear energy, uh, known as Kaker. It was designed for a population of 250,000 people uh, to the south of the capital, Riyadh. It's designed as a city that is powered totally by, by renewable energy. So here that you have a thermal energy tower with reflectors, uh, reflecting sun onto uh, onto this tower here. You have uh, wind turbines along the ridge here. You have uh, solar panels on the, on the roof of buildings. You have uh, deep thermal energy uh, from, beneath, from deep uh, energy from the ground. You have uh, uh, wind power, solar power. You have energy from waste uh, and standby uh, nuclear fuel uh, facility. So, the, the principle here was that oil, uh, oil powered vehicles, gasoline powered vehicles would be entirely banned in this city. It was a, uh, a city to be built for the days when Saudi Arabia ran out of oil, which is in the not too distant future. I think it may be only 40 years before they run out of, uh, uh, they run out of oil entirely. So oil powered vehicles or gas powered vehicles were banned entirely from the city. And next, we move on to the next slide. A conceptual design for the Kariba Dam Eco City in Zimbabwe, where the plan uh, uh, that materialized was to allow for elephants and other wild animals to make their way from the game reserves down to the waters of the Kariba Dam through green corridors, which were included in the overall plan. And next slide, please. Uh, and, and, and here are some concept sketches for the master plan for a state capital at Polka in Nigeria, again using these basic principles of mapping. So the next slide shows in 2016, I moved from uh, back from Llewellyn Davis Yang in London and I returned to Southeast Asia. There's a story to this. I won't tell you all the story, but many of the projects that we designed were not built. They were not built for many reasons. And you have to get used to this as an architect. They were not built because uh, Muhammad Gaddafi was assassinated in, 
in Libya and all the the the, uh, the, the university projects stop. King Abdullah was uh, taken Ill, Ill and his, his nephew took over the uh, ruling the Saudi Arabia and the Saudi Arabian city was not built. And the uh, extension to the city of Mosul was uh, built uh, just before ISIS came down and created a uh, caliphate in the city of Mosul. And there was uh, a, a, a terrible uh, uh, backlash against the local population. And that too didn't proceed. So you can never actually know what's going to happen ahead of you. And many of your, much of your ende endeavors, I have to say, will suddenly will finish up uh, in, in uh, these presentations, but will not, you will not find them built in, in reality. Nevertheless, we go on. This is where I am now. I, uh, I uh, have two art libraries, my library in, Bright in Brighton on the top slide, and my Bright my Bright library in uh, Kuala Lumpur on the bottom slide. My life is split between these two uh, residences. I write, I paint, and I reach out to educational uh, institutions. The broad issues that interest me, next slide please, are climate change, species extinction, deforestation, air and water pollution, social resilience, migration, and the plight of indigenous people displaced by urbanization in Asia. The next slide, please. I review students in graduate classes. This is a review of students at the University, Singapore University of Technology and Design in Singapore in 2019. And next slide, please. And uh, in the last, in my last few months at uh, Taylor, in my last years at, uh, uh, in academia at Taylor's University, I researched a, a potential for publication on Malaysian pattern language, inspired by Christopher Alexander's book on that name. And I researched more recently, my attention turned to the theory of behavior settings, settings, I'm so sorry, behavior settings, and I identified 150 behavior settings in Malaysia. Next slide, please. Shortly before, Leaving Taylor's University, I produced a plan for the regeneration of a street in the historic town of Klang, employing that behavior setting theory. And a bid for state funding was made, and the decision is still awaited. Again, you have to, you're at the, you're at the behest of changes in politics. In the time I've been in Malaysia, the government has changed three times. And no sooner was the request put in for funding for this project than the state government changed and the uh, chief minister departed and a new chief minister came in. So shortly before leaving Till as well, I was involved in, uh, uh, the, uh, in a project to research the, the uh, conservation of uh, Ulamuda primary forest. And this is a mind map, map that I produced that in 2019. Next slide, please. Insights into the Malaysian tropical house on the basis of my of webinars. There's one at a Petra Kuta night in Penang on uh, streaming live globally on the uh, tropical Malaysian house. And another one, a webinar on insights on the tropical Malaysian house, drawing, drawing on the expertise of, of some of the local architects. The next one. I wrote a book in 2015, The New Sri Lankan House. It builds upon, builds upon the interest that many architects have and the work of Jeffrey Bauer. Most of the architects in this publication worked for Bauer at some time in their career. And in 2019, the, the book was translated into uh, Japanese and published in, in uh, Tokyo. Next slide, please. My two most recent books are, slide please, The, Tro the Tropical Malaysian House, Volume 1, Trop and The Tropical Malaysian, Volume 2. Here I attempted to answer a question what one journalist asked me when I published it, uh, the first book. He said, uh, but what's Malaysian about this house, these houses? Why is it different to houses in Indonesia, houses in Thailand, houses in Singapore? Why is it different? What makes it Malaysian? You know that, that 
that let me dumbfound it. I hadn't really thought what was the difference between this one. So in these books, I set out to, put, to try and find out what was the essence of a house, a tropical house in Malaysia. And I concluded the directory of architects, designers and house owners in the book indicates the rich mix of ethnicities in Malaysia. You have Malay, you have Chinese, Hakka, Tichau, Puchau, Hokkien and Chan Cantonese. You have Indian, you have Sri Lankan, Tamil and Sinhalese, and you have mixed uh, people of Dayak Iban, Pidayu, and Milano uh, origin, the original people of, uh, of, of Malaysia. These are augmented by others of Singaporean, Indonesian, French, Swedish, British, Australian, and German origin. And their different cultures are all evident in the evolving form of the Malaysian tropical house. Next slide, please. I'm currently working on a new book on, it's entitled Terrace, Terrace Transformations in the Tropics, Design in Section. And I was really interested in some of the sections that were, were shown in the earlier presentation uh, by Kundun Ga, Ga, and some of the sections of the houses that she had designed in uh, latitude 10 degrees north were not that different from the houses that are designed here in latitude three degrees north. Uh, they, they respond to the tropical monsoons, they respond to the, the nat getting natural ventilation into the house, they get respond to the idea of getting natural daylight into the house, and to connect to greenery. And so this house book is all about those, uh, those ideas, because they will all help in reducing the need for energy produced by non-renewable resources. So I jump daily from the small to the big. I jump, sorry, next slide, please. I jump from look at studying uh, houses to studying the, uh, the, the city. This is the, I jump from these houses and studying the greenery in these houses to next slide. And two days a week, I give uh, consultancy to a social purpose organization based in Malaysia with a mission of making cities more people friendly, resilient and livable. It's a catalyst for changing the way cities are planned, developed and celebrated. Next slide, please. My job has been to create a city management uh, program and it focuses on four mod uh, modules with courses on resilience, analytics, placemaking and conservation. Next slide, please. But I try to stay focused on the protection of nature at a global, national and local uh, level. I travel with, travel with my daughter, Zara Shakira, to Sri Lanka and we look we, to, to observe elephants and the protection of elephants and look at the Ulumudu reserve, scientific reserve in, or the reserve in, uh, in Kedam in, in Malaysia and the Malaysian uh, the protection of Malaysian elephants. I look at, I'm active in trying to reduce uh, uh, logging in, in the, in the uh, Malaysian forest. And twice or three times a week, I cycle around the quarry below my house here in, uh, uh, in Kuala Lumpur. And here you can see lizards, which are something like one and a half meters long. The monitor lizards that, that, that swim in the lake and occasionally cross your path as you're cycling. And occasionally there's a, an iguana. It's not a native of Malaysia, but one somehow found its way into the quarry. And there are these beads here, birds here in the, uh, in the, uh, in the quarry that uh, are, are attracted by the, uh, by the water. I think that although my targets were, are different to those of my socialist grandfather, I think in some ways he would approve of this conservation of nature as much as he fought against the uh, problems of uh, of uh, the, the in in society in his time in the uh, 1930s. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I've taken so long, and that, that the uh, the presentation broke down a little bit when I lost my uh, uh, my slides and had to wait for them to turn up. But thank you very much. Thank you, Robert, sir, for sharing your work and experience. I invite Kunjan Ma'am to rejoin us. 
We will now begin the discussion and question and answer session. I request the audience again to ask questions in the Q&A tab and mention who the question is addressed to. Upon selection of your question, we will prompt you to turn on your video and audio. Do make sure to upload the question you would like to be asked. Um, I would like to uh, prompt the con this conversation with, uh, um, with a question that um, like Kunjan Ma'am had mentioned in her, in her presentation that um, like if you talk about identities, then there are um, multiple identities and you know you cannot really be certain like it just imply that you're considering a lot of different identities and um, even even robert sir in his presentation also talked about him um, him making these partial annotations and how to orchestrate space and also and also his study on evolution of uh, morphology so uh, as you know, taking it back to the discussion, the curated discussion that we had yesterday, there was this term uncertainty that we were talking about. And I just want to ask um, like if one is dealing with this, when is one, one is designing with nature at the scale of a dwelling, then uh, how do we as architects uh, incorporate or how do we consider uncertainty? What does it mean? What does uncertainty mean in this context? If, what is what? what is uncertainty. Uncertainty. Okay. Yeah, like this term was brought yesterday as well, and and I had been thinking about it. So, if uh, you could uh, tell. I'm sorry, I lost like the last thirty seconds of your question due to connectivity. Can you just just start from yesterday? There was there was an articulation about uncertainty, and then I yes. lost you from there. So, so yes, so uh, taking that forward, when one is designing with nature at the scale of uh, dwelling, uh, then how do we as architects, we consider the factor of uncertainty uh, when you're dealing with nature? And what does it even mean for that matter, for us to understand as students, like when we're gonna go ahead and we have to deal with uncertainty, you must have seen it across uh, various projects that understanding would have uh, developed in certain way. So what does it even mean? Like, how do we consider it? It's ironical, but yeah, how do we consider uncertainty? Okay. Uncertainty. Um, right, go on, you, you go Robert, ahead. Do you want to take that? First? No, no, you go ahead. Sorry. Well, there are, um, as, as architects, um, we, we are not we are not uh, we are not determinants of life. Uh, all we do, as as someone would uh, uh, articulate this, is is just to sort of frame a duration uh, within which certain activities happen. And uh, uncertainty. Well, it's it's you know well, I I'm not sure if I'm going to be waking up tomorrow it's 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 as intimate as that uh, and and th there is just that much that you can program uh, but what you can program uh, what actually you can program uncertainties because uh, th the moment you let in what what are what are what are the possibilities of uh, of of changes that could be happening that, that you age well that, uh, that things around you grow well, that you grow around your surroundings. And, and how all of that pans out is, is really is, 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 is a matter of time. You, you, have to, you, have to be, you have to just be patient and, and let it unfold. Yeah? But, but this, that, that, that frame that you create maybe becomes, becomes the possibility of that unfolding. So the moment you 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 shut yourself off, it's it's actually um, um, it's 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 an illusion. If you would we would be able to to be so deterministic to say that this will not happen in the space I design. Um, I, I don't know about that. I mean, in in all of these, uh, I mean, let's not get into details. I think. And uncertainty also, like 
you know as 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 built into the process of your of your work you you start with something and 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 there is an idea and and you know and and it's all negotiations that's why uh, even thinking about the, the, the uh, you know thinking about the client that's that's why i said we think about it in, in, in spaces of collectives the site is is a larger geograph the client is a larger people you know all of that our language has continuity all of that and and um, and and within that there are there, there it's all these these collectives that will come and negotiate with each other yes and and uh, there's so, so there's this this one germ that you start with and by the time it it becomes and and you you think you finish the project you should you know, we, we go that 10 years later and and it's wonderful sometimes sometimes it's not and you know not not all the time it does it pan out to be the way you imagine um and sometimes it just surpasses all of your expectations it turns out to do you don't know where you are as an architect can i pick up on that please i think uh, my short answer to it is i think you must embrace uncertainty it's actually quite in invigorating uncertainty if you're certain it stultifies your 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 moving forward if it's absolutely certain where can you go from there you need uncertainty to give you the the the, the vigor to move forward i think most of my life has been about uncertainty some of the things are, are certain but i couldn't tell you precisely what's going to happen tomorrow and that's a, that's that's i i think uh, I think I'm taking up what you were, to some extent what you, you what, what you you're saying maybe not exactly the same words but I would I would say for any student embrace uncertainty don't uh, don't feel that uncertainty is is uh, a barrier I think it is actually uh, a something which can stimulate your creativity and that's my short answer to the you to your question Um, do you want to come back on that? Do you not feel? Do you not agree uh, that uncertainty is? Uh, uh, no, no. I mean uh, uh, the, the questioner. The questioner. Do you wish to come back and uh, do you have a different view on uncertainty? Oh, um, well, starting off as as a student who's just about to graduate, I think uh, life is very uncertain for me to even decide uh, anything <laughs> related to architecture. Um, but I agree with you. Um, like it's all about yes embracing uncertainty and uh, probably how you embrace it is also very uncertain it's it's as ma'am also say how the events unfold and uh, and i think your experiences of travel have been like it it's been uh, amazing to watch your presentation about your travels that's actually some something where you yes. encounter most of the uh, uncertainty in like a history class yeah <laughs> I, I, th I would just I would answer, uh, also say look, the reality is I, I might be, be picked up on this, but the, the reality is you will only ever build about ten percent of what you design. Is that is that that that's that's the reality, and you can't control the circumstances. As I said, uh, some of the projects that we've done where we spent a year or eighteen months and a lot of month, time and consultancies, money and so on. to produce a scheme and then there's an act of war and we have to get out and we can't go back and they won't pay so you 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 the, the scheme stops there and no. it's not a and, and then or even in a, a a country of comparative calm and safety such as malaysia which i am in at the moment the 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 the, the normal uh, process of 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 of, of uh, de democratic process of a new government being being formed when a new government comes in they they have a different uh, they'd have a different perspective on on certain developments and uh, your one one party can say yes we're going to stop logging another party can say we're going to resume logging so you 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 cannot be sure there's no there's no certainty at all of what's going to happen and i think you have to really just as i said at the outset you have to embrace it and get on with it and some of the things you do will materialize and you'll get a great deal of enjoyment out of doing those and some of those things they will be break they you will break through with those 
Okay. So, uh, related to your travels, we have a question here. Um, so, it says, you mentioned that when you were studying, most, most urban books were influenced by the West. Is there something uh, you would like to share about urbanism in Asia that you observed and have understood through your travels? Um, yeah, I, well, well, yes, there, there is. I mean, I mean, uh, there's some very simple things it, like uh, that would apply in 10 degrees north of the equator and three degrees north of the equator, which is uh, Cochin and uh, Kochi and, uh, and, and Kuala Lumpur. I mean, the, the very concept of an urban square is different. In, in Europe, in Italy, you sit outside in the square in the sun and you have a glass of wine and it's beautiful. You don't sit outside in a square in, uh, in, in, in Kuala Lumpur in the middle of the day and you, you, you sit in the shade. Uh, actually, this is something I quickly found when I got married. I was married to a, a Malaysian uh, Ceylonese that when we went on holiday, she was sitting under a, a parasol and I was sitting in the sun. And uh, it, this, this was the, how we, we react differently to the sun, for example. And some, uh, like Kevin Mark Lowe, who comes occasionally to Ahmedabad, he devised a tropical square. And it was all about planting trees at, on a grid. And they, they were uh, at a grid of about, I don't know, about three or four meters. And they formed a canopy of green. So you could actually sit under a canopy of green in the middle of a, tro a tropical square, as opposed to uh, not, not being able. So I thought that, I think there are things like that, but of course you use space, urban space differently. You use space uh, in, a, in a way where you try to find uh, shade and you try, try to find places where there's, a, there's natural ventilation. Um, these, these are, that's a simple example of urban design, which is which is different. Uh, but I found many others. I mean, the way of eating in, uh, in, in, in Asia is very different. The hawker stores, the people with their, with their, that are trading from the, the side of the road and, and people uh, in Ho Chi Minh City or Hanoi or Kuala Lumpur, they, they buy their food and they sit by the side of the stall. It's a, a different way of, of acting in the urban setting. And I find this, I, when I said, uh, there's this, this uh, study known as behavior settings. Uh, and uh, it's, it, was a, it was actually a, a study in the 1960s or something by an uh, environmental psychologist called Barker. And it was taken up by an Australian uh, uh, academic called John Lang. And he developed the idea of behavioral settings where settings are actually they reflect the activity that takes place in them and the and the activity uh, gives life to the, uh, the the urban urban form around it's it's um, I, I've identified 150 such urban settings in Malaysia behavior settings and I think they're they are unique to the uh, to the a tropical setting they're different to anything I've found in the north, northern hemisphere. So yes, I think urban design. There must, there should be books on urban design in, in the tropics, in Cochin, in, uh, uh, in, in Bangalore, in, 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 in Dhaka, and in, uh, and, and in uh, Malaysia. And I've yet to find a publisher who will do that. But we will, hope we will find eventually. And we also had to find how to sell a book which has urban title, as you mentioned. Big pardon? And we are also yet to find the way to sell a book which has urban in the title. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, I must. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you caught it. It, it, it is yeah. quite amazing how uh, tropical Malaysian house sold forty-five thousand, and I think urban Asian house is still trying to make a profit some twenty years later or whatever it is. Yeah. Urban is not exciting, tropical is, but uh, yeah, good point. Tropical space. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have another question to you, sir. Um, that Asian homes mostly rely on uh, passive technology and your high-rise housing designs are extremely technocratic in their approach. 
So how does your knowledge of the former inform your decisions for the latter? What, that's right. Can you say again? The, 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 uh, the... So uh, I'll repeat the question. Uh, yes. Asian houses mostly rely on passive technology and your high-rise housing designs are extremely technocratic in their approach. It's extremely? Technocratic. Technocratic, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, how does your knowledge of the former inform your decisions for the latter? Um, do you want to answer this at all? I, I, um, I, I think you are, uh, um, you are more qualified to do that because I, I, uh, I can only talk uh, uh, speculatively because I have yet to deal with scale of that sort. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, look, I, I, I give an example. I'm sitting in a room now. I'm on the 18th story of a uh, condominium block. There are four apartments on this block and I'm looking out to the north of uh, I, I I've got four air conditioning units in this uh, apartment. There are two in this room. There's one in each of the two bedrooms. The, the, I have never put on three of those air conditioning units. I only use one air conditioner. And it's possible to, uh, to live in a high-rise apartment. I, I leave my kitchen window wide open all day, and I leave my apartment sliding doors open. When I, they're open now, to the, and, 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 and ventilation is coming in in a passive way. You know, it's not, uh, I, but I do use two, two, uh, sli uh, two uh, fans to move the air around. Uh, I don't think it's, I, I think you can learn something from the low rise uh, 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 morphology, the, the low rise uh, plans of houses. You can learn how to orient it correctly. You can learn how to use the Venturi effect to have openings on one side of a building which are wide and openings on the other side of the building which are narrow. So you get positive and ne negative pressure and, and air moves through buildings without having to put air conditioning. Uh, you can, uh, you can, you can use solar, solar, yeah, you can use solar. But no, you say passive method. I think that's, those are the principal ones, the, the orientation and the Venturi method. You can use those in high rise buildings too. Of course, it's very difficult to persuade everybody to go that down that route. But I think increasingly we've got to do that. Uh, you know, as climate change strikes home, you cannot be eating the amount of uh, uh, non-renewable energy that we do at the moment. We've got to make high-rise buildings uh, uh, work on a on less less energy. We will have to do that, otherwise, you uh, we, we can't move forward. And the the, the challenge is to design high-rise housing, which will uh, and and I think Yang Ken Yang did have some thing to say about that in that one building that I illustrated, Manara Messiniaga. It's not perfect, but it is. It did have some of the uh, attributes of a of a, a passive uh, uh, design in the high-rise high high-rise uh, high uh, building. So if I, if I could add the speculative bit now, because uh, clearly, I mean, I've got worked on projects, but then one, uh, so, so these are, of course, the, the, you know, the, the technical aspects of it, which are absolutely there, and, and, and they have data, they have all of that. There are there are these other aspects that could that could um, get into design, which is which is also passive design in a way. Um, in in uh, you know what what is what is the idea of, of efficiency really? So if um, if there is that if there is that little bit of extra space, um, you know that 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 contribute to, uh, to, to 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 a better sense of community and well-being and and a, a, a sort of a, a, a community between a, a sort of activity between people. We saw some of those those projects that you know um, Sarosh presented yesterday, where, where where his students were working on 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 food yeah, within buildings, high rises, and so on. Um, other projects like that. I mean, there are several. Where uh, now, so that really, I mean, it all of this is is sort of hinged on this this idea of what is efficient. You know, so that does 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 that little extra 
bit that that contributes to well being that would would that mean efficiency in the long run yes it would because that's one of the most passive things you could do it it pays back it pays back because uh, because people are happier and and um, and, and so so to, to to program those little useless spaces the little um, the, the things that you cannot put a label on it's not like you know it's not named something and and so on and so forth and, and you know all of that contributes to to a passive wellness and that could happen within within any program i think that, you know, it, it relates to your earlier question about uncertainty uh, the, the the question seems to uh, questionnaire or the questioner seems to assume that we will have to have technical solutions to everything, and I, I would say that that uh, you you should should go the other route and look at ways in which we can uh, we can live with less technology, and uh, that uh, 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 new ideas may well come out of that sort of investigation, and and yesterday there were there were some. Good examples of uh, it, it, I, I, I enjoyed the idea that uh, students were putting forward questions, not always with an answer at the end, but they were questioning. And here again, we should be questioning. Another another title for a, for a thesis might be uh, the, the 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 low uh, uh, technology high rise building. One of my own students did something along those lines in in uh, uh, in 2019. Uh, accepted that uh, you moved up a building possibly by a ramp rather than always by vertical elevators, that you created the sense of community along these ramps and behavior settings along these ramps. And in the very process, you got exercise, you exercised more, you were healthier by moving around the building instead of just taking the elevator. There's a better sense of community because you you saw people on your route up the building rather than standing in the corner of a, 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 of a uh, lift car in an elevator and not talking to anybody but looking at your shoes all the time. You know how it is. You go into a, uh, into a lift, uh, into an elevator and don't talk to anybody. There's no conversation. So think about high rise building in a very different way and uh, think passively. I think that's the answer. We have one last question. And um, the house is designed by Kunjan for the disaster relief in Kerala. And the house that Robert resided in is, uh, in his early years in Indonesia speak volumes about frugality in design and the idea of self-made. Can you talk about it as a part of the design process? The question is addressed to both of you. Can, I'm sorry. Can you can you go through it again slowly for me? I'm, I'm not or, here. Yeah. 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 The houses designed by Kunjan for disaster relief in Kerala and the houses that Robert resided in in his early years in Indonesia speak volumes about frugality in design and the idea of self-made. Can you talk about it as a part of design process? Um, yes. Uh, so this idea of frugality and, and the self-made, well, it, it's, it's, it does not it does not uh, decide only in uh, and and that is that is how i'm understanding the question where, where that's why I, I i think it's a nice question because it's it's not only you know when when you design disaster relief or it's or not it's not only when when you are doing the the so called budget projects or, or so on it's it's an idea that that pervades just about all of these other projects that we worked on, I think the, the most um, whatever the, 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 even even the the commission you know, which which haven't been too many, but even the commission that says like you know you, you do whatever you want to, which is, which is rare. And, uh, but even in those, these these ideas um, are working because you you are I mean us we 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 are constantly we are constantly thinking about. What is the right thing to do? What is the right thing to do given um, given um, given the context, of course, um, the, the the life of of the people that are going to be living there, their aspirations are all of that. Uh, but also, you know, and all of that. But also, 
also this 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 little aspect of you know this 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 joy of doing something well just just and and that little idea of um, of 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 something done nicely giving you this this sense of um, this you know uh, it, 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 the beauty of life i don't know there are there are better words for this i'm sure but and and is you know so the, within all of those parameters you do something that is right but you do not do something so often times there, there there's been there been projects where clients have come to us and said and actually said that you know i don't think you're going to going you, you you know you guys are capable of sort of going to the extent that we really want to so we just raise our hands and please because that 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 little idea of joy is also it's it's as important to us as the idea of frugality even when it comes to the disaster relief house because you you want the, what is the quality of light in a house like that you know do you, do you, is it is it just because it's 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 a house that is built in one lakh and and within two weeks do you make a mess of it no you want to do it nicely you want to do it well there's there's somebody living there and and yeah i mean all of that so i mean so these are related you know so frugality is 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 in the context of of all of these you know frugality is is uh, uh, and and the self made so the self made is is when when the lives of people are are sort of uh, enmeshed in in the process uh, we you know i mean yes when we were when we were learning there was there was there was this question that what what is the space of the architect in in that in that space that you design and and that is that space of little the space of joy the space of making something well and all of that but the rest of it is 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 their space and they are always involved so it to to, to that um, to to that end it's it's not about self made it's it's about made together I don't. I don't think I can add to that. I, I don't. I don't have the. Uh, I, I have not done any uh, disaster relief housing at all, so I. I can't add much to that. But what I do just wanted to say is, uh, I was so excited by some of the houses that you showed uh, at the outset of your presentation. This is. They were really exciting. The section that you uh, produced, uh, and I'm sure that the sections worked to allow wind to flow through the house and so, and so on. I want to come and see these. So I'm just hoping that uh, COVID-19 will go away quite quickly and I can come to uh, to monsoon India and the, the monsoon coast and see how you actually tackle these houses. Because uh, the sections you showed, I was instantly thought, there's something here that is very exciting. And I'd like to I'd like to come and see, see, see those. Soon. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. That means a lot coming from you. So, um, do we have any concluding notes from your side as we proceed towards the end of it? No, it's just been it's it's been um, like I said it's 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 been an emotional sort of uh, moment for us to to be you know to be invited to be a part of this forum for several reasons, um, but it's also been uh, been a bit of a uh, a bit of a churning because there, there were two things that happened uh, very honestly one is that um, in spite of the short time uh, we we really did want to put something together which was uh, which was honest um, it it spoke uh, it spoke about us as much um, as our histories and and what what we project and all of that so that that sort of a churning has been good for us you know to to let, let's let's put what we have done so it it, it wasn't it, it was more about the, the the process of sort of evolving rather than most presentations are these you know show and tells where you come and you know this project is there it's, it's not about that at all so it, it was more about ideas what what are we trying you know let's let's articulate because that this is the context and 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 the other part of it that that i found quite amazing um was uh, was yes being with the panelists you know being with some amazing people and just listening in and just just 
just to stay quiet and just listen to what is going on um, for for these entire um, five days, and I look forward to the day tomorrow as well. Uh, that has 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 meant a lot for us in you know in sort of critiquing our own direction. It it becomes reflective. It becomes responsive. Um, all of that, and and lastly, but but not the least because that is the the sole reason why why all of this comes together is is the is the four panelists the the, the 15 projects that were there um um i i it was it was really good work and that that again becomes a reference of sorts you know it's it's really i wish i could i could have seen the other 165 honestly because you know such uh, it, it was just it, it was just a pleasure honestly and an honor to 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 be a part of this truly i think i'll save my remarks for tomorrow and think i think uh, deeply on them tomorrow morning uh, before uh, before before giving my concluding r remarks uh, but just very simply, I've enjoyed this process as well. I was told I would uh, enjoy it, and that I would get uh, and, and, and and you and you forced me to think. You forced me to think, uh, uh, and 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 uh, you know, this was this was no joyride. I had to I had to to think a little about what I was going to to, to present to you, and you've uh, and that was helpful. Now I'm going to send that to my daughter in London and say, look, this is what I, this is what I've been doing for the last uh, so many years. And uh, perhaps I don't talk about it at home. And perhaps I haven't told you what I was doing, but maybe you, uh, you, you, you watch the YouTube of this and uh, you, you know a little bit more about your father now. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I need to, to corroborate that. My, my kid is back home watching this and I'm, I'm going to be very happy going home today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, uh, on that note, we will conclude today's session. I would like to thank both our panelists for joining us today and inciting such thought-provoking and insightful discussions, compelling us to think critically about uh, our past experiences, our practices then, and also our future, to rethink and most importantly question the convention, the understandings of this fragile relationship of human and nature. I would also like to thank everyone on behalf of KVDS team for joining us today on Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube. Uh, with this session, uh, it has been an exciting week, and we come to the end of the event. So thank you for being with us till now, and do join us tomorrow for the, for the culmination of this year's forum. It starts at 10 AM. Visit our website for all the information on further schedule and details. Stay safe and stay healthy. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Aditi, Kevna, Riddhi, Shreya, all of you guys. Thanks. Good night. Thank you so much.